we cannot gauge the worth of another soul any more than we can measure the span of the universe. We know from modern revelation that the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. At times like that, just look up and leave. It's up to us to go down the road that leads us back home. It's up to us to see we already are what we want to be. Don't give in to what others say. Welcome to the Worth of Souls podcast. I'm Andrea. And I'm Brent. We're very excited to have you join us. However you found out about this podcast series, we want you to know that it is no accident that you are here. The principles that we will discuss in all 14 lessons of this podcast series have been life-changing for us, and we're really excited to share them with you. We felt inspired to put this podcast together because we have noticed, as I'm sure many of you have, that in the last little while, there has been an exodus from the church that has been happening. Stalwart members of the church, we hear the phrase all the time, I never thought they would leave. Stalwart members are leaving their covenants and abandoning the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. In every situation of this that has happened in our lives that we have been able to see, that those rock-solid members who have left simply stopped applying the principles of the gospel and stopped striving to become one with Christ in their daily lives. But really, what should we expect? That following our Savior would be a cakewalk? We have been born into the last of the last days before his second coming. The war that we valiantly fought in on the side of Christ and Michael in the preexistence wages still today. We hope that you don't mistakenly think that the Lord intended you to be born into some quasi-Garden of Eden experience. Right. (laughs) With fruits and flowers everywhere. In reality, he dropped you right into the middle of D-Day, and you are storming the beaches of Normandy on the side of the Allied armies. In a very real way, we are at war every day for our very souls. Satan uses every worldly thing in our society that surrounds us as his arsenal against us. Those bullets and fiery darts never cease to fly at us from that great and spacious building while we are holding tight to the iron rod and pressing forward towards the tree of life. But what are our weapons in this war against the adversary? Those weapons are exactly what we are going to discuss in these lessons. We don't want any more casualties in the spiritual war. Exactly. Stay in the good ship Zion. Exactly. And understand that the Armies of the adversary are formidable, and the temptations of the great and spacious building are real. And strong and everywhere. And they're getting stronger every day. Yes, and they will keep doing so. But they can be overcome as we daily strive to become like Jesus Christ. Elder Holland said it best. He said this. When we face such temptations in our time, we must declare as young Nephi did in his... I will give place no more for the enemy of my soul. We can reject the evil one. If we want it dearly and deeply enough, that enemy can and will be rebuked by the redeeming power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that the fact that you are listening to a podcast like this means that you do want it deeply enough. And I testify along with Elder Holland, the enemy of your soul can and will be rebuked as you strive to become like Jesus Christ. What we are going to teach you, it's not new. These are timeless principles from God about how to become like our Savior. Yeah, these, are, these are not principles that Andrea and Brent Palmer made up. Exactly. No, not at all. We first found them in a seminar series by Brother James Cox in a program called Becoming Spiritually Centered. Brother Cox started teaching this material in seminars over 30 years ago, and he is the expert of all the experts on this. His website is 
N-M-I-U-T dot com. That's Nancy Mary I-U-T dot com. Yes. We love his program. We recommend it so much. He's a fantastic mentor. Another source for us for this material is a wonderful man that put together a um, manual that he calls Becoming Christ-Centered. His name is Peter Simona, and you can find his stuff at becomingchristcentered.com. We are presenting this both in podcast format and on YouTube and Rumble for any of you who want to participate in the visuals that we've also put together. Our website is worthofsoulspodcast.com. All of the content from each of the lessons is on that website as well as our detailed bios if you want to get to know us a little bit better. Also, please take a few minutes to follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Worth of Souls Podcast. We would love to hear the experiences that you are having while you're going through these lessons. Yeah, that's right. We we feel inspired when we hear those things. And if you also feel inspired to put together your own study group, as many have um, before, you're more than welcome to use any of our material from the podcast or the website. It's super valuable to process and share experiences together with those that you love, since we're all in this lifelong process to become like Jesus Christ together. <laughs> Brent and I are also working on all this stuff. We're still in school ourselves. Yes. The first two lessons in this series they are the foundation for the entire course itself. And then the subsequent lessons are about the 12 thought habits of Jesus Christ and how to use them in our daily life. Just by way of introduction, we are Brent and Andrea Palmer. We're from St. George, Utah. Andrea grew up in southeast Idaho, and I grew up, uh, well, along the I-15 corridor. Yeah, we like to joke about that. <laughs> I've, my family moved 18 times before my mission. He's an excellent packer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm from a lot of places. <laughs> we both served missions for the church. I served in Milano, Italia, and Andrea served in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, we have four children, mm -hmm. and... Three Andrea's degree. Three boys, one girl, three. as you can see, if you could see the pictures, yeah. they're so cute. Andrea's <laughs> professional background is she has a degree in in uh, organizational behavior, and my professional background is in hospitality and finance. And at this point in our lives, we've both held numerous callings in the church, but really our favorite thing to do is to teach gospel doctrine class. Yes. Oh my gosh, I love that calling. And more than anything, we are just trying to be disciples of Jesus Christ and trying to prepare our hearts to hopefully do what President Nelson continues to invite us to do, which is prepare for Zion and for Christ's return. It really is an exciting time to be alive. Yes, it is. Elder, Elder Maxwell, he said one of my favorite quotes of, yes, Armageddon is coming, but so is Adam on Diamond. Exactly. I love that quote. And that's the day we live in. And this is the day that prophets have looked forward to since the beginning of time. The study of thought, the thought habits of Jesus Christ that we are going to do together in these lessons are the key that will pre prepare you and me to be ready to walk into the city Zion and be among those people who will welcome the Savior back to this earth. Yeah. <laughs> How's that for a setup? <laughs> Listening to these lessons will get you ready for Zion. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I'm sure we'll do just fine. <laughs> okay, let's dive in. I want to start with a story. It's a story that is very close to my heart because it is from a chapter in my book of life. Within a nine-month period of time, I lost both my youngest sister, my mother, and my grandmother. They all graduated and went to the other side. Those nine months were full. They were full of driving in the middle of the night, doing a lot of dishes, moving oxygen tubes around, rubbing my sister's swollen body to try to ease any of her agonizing pain, crying with my siblings, witnessing priesthood blessings of comfort and release, holding throw-up bowls for my, my mom, trying to meet the needs of my own family and watching my mother's last breath. The roller coaster of emotions, in those moments, they're so raw and vulnerable. And your insides are totally exposed, especially when dealing with grief. 
looking back on all of that, and even in this very moment itself, when I'm still processing it and understanding it and grieving, I can testify that joy in Christ is possible even during the very difficult adversities that show up in our lives. They're the bombs that go off in this war that we're a part of. And gratitude is a power. It is untapped by most of us. And I can testify that my testimony of being spiritually focused is more rooted now than it ever has been before. The main reason I can confidently say that, that I am more joyous now, even after going through so many painful experiences and all of the experiences that happened before then in my life, it is because of the gift of learning about the thought habits of Jesus Christ 25 years ago. I diligently applied the knowledge that I learned. I went over the lessons over and over and over again (laughs) in order to build habits of spiritual focus and learning how to see, think, feel, and do as Christ does and, and feeling the joy that he brings that is unsurpassed by anything else. The way that Andrea responded to these challenges in her life and was able to remain in joy was through the continual study of the thought habits of Jesus Christ and becoming spiritually focused in her daily choices. When we say thought habit, what are we talking about? Yes, let's make sure to get on the same page because definitions with people, we can get lost if we don't make sure that we're talking about the same thing. A thought habit or paradigm is our pre-programmed emotional response that we give in any given situation. Just like a physical habit of, say, brushing your teeth or putting on your shoes, things that we do nearly exactly the same every time. You watch. If you haven't paid attention to this before, the next time you do this, you will notice that you probably put on the same shoe every time, either left or the right. Mm -hmm. You tie the, the same one the same way every time. You put the toothpaste on the toothbrush the exact same way every time. These are habits that we have formed in our physical lives. We have similar habits in our thoughts and emotions that automatically happen inside of us because of how we have trained ourselves, usually without having to consciously even think about it. And I like to think of a thought habit or a thought paradigm as the emotional furniture of my mind. That you have things set up in your mind a certain way about certain things, and whether we like to admit it or not, we have patterns of behavior. That's just how it is. We have blueprints inside of us that we use on a daily basis as we're reacting to situations, most of the time subconsciously. A thought habit is a very ingrained habit of reaction. Natural man thought habits and paradigms They creep up on us in so many temporal situations in this life and in this world. Those thought habits lead to our automatic emotional responses. For instance, stop and think about, let's say, how you react emotionally when someone cuts you off in traffic, so you have to slam on your brakes. Is your response Christ-like in that situation? Every time, 100% of the time. (laughs) Or what about when one of your children breaks a glass vase that maybe was very precious and and from Italy, per se? (laughs) That hasn't happened to us. (laughs) Do you gather them up in your arms and help them feel the love of the Savior in the midst of their mistake? The idea of becoming like Christ or becoming one with Christ are thrown around so often in our culture. That sometimes I feel like it's easy for our eyes to glaze over whenever we hear it or it's talked about in a lesson. We're inviting you today to hear that concept, as it were, for the first time and really ask yourself the question, what does it mean for me to become one with Christ? Or what does it look like for me to become like my Savior? And ask yourself, what would that process look like? So that someday I can stand before him and know that I had worked with my whole soul to become like he is out of my love for him. 
not just because I was, quote, supposed to or because somebody else would judge me if I didn't. Because my bishop told me to. Right. But because that's what I want. Growing a relationship with your Savior, it's such an adventure of the soul. And we operate on the idea that it's not what's happening around us that's important. It's what's happening inside of us. Every day is worthwhile no matter what is happening in the celestial world around. And throughout our discussions, we're going to use the three sources of truth constantly, which are the scriptures, the words of the prophets, and personal revelation. When these three sources all agree, we can be very assured that we will not be led astray by false voices. Please remember that Brent and I, we are not a substitution for the Holy Ghost. We are not a member of the Godhead. Disclaimer, we are not a member of the Godhead. (laughs) Right, exactly. Oh, we are going to be your guide and uh, your companion throughout these lessons. But please remember that your teacher is always first and foremost the Holy Ghost. We are still in the process of progression ourselves, obviously, very much. Our children can attest to that. Uh, and we will be for the rest of our That's lives. That's right. <laughs> we are we are trying to become more like our Savior every day. And just like we are inviting you to do. We hope that in these lessons, uh, in these discussions, that, that, that you're not looking for a conversation about the doctrines of the gospel as they are routinely covered in Sunday school. Even though Sunday school is great. We told you we love teaching gospel doctrine. That beautiful Sunday school lesson is not going to help you later that night when you get into a fight with your teenage child about the text message you found on their phone. We are going to look at the raw realities of the war that is raging around us and how to stand shoulder to shoulder in that battle with Jesus Christ, who we know is already triumphant. Those moments when we face those everyday situations that try our souls What are we going to focus on? Are your daily experiences helping you to become more rooted in Christ? Or are these life events causing you to feel like you are being scorched by the heat of the day? If we are here to have joy, can you imagine yourself having joy in some of the following circumstances? Like your teenage son comes in three hours late without telling you where he was. You have twin babies that will not sleep and you've been up all night long. Your husband comes to you and tells you that he's lost his job. Or you get a call from your family member that your father has committed suicide. Or you succumb to an addiction again. Or your daughter announces to you that she's bisexual. Maybe it's your son calling you from jail. Or you're diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and you don't know anything about it and it's overwhelming. Perhaps it's your car breaking down on your way to pick up your kids and and you just have no idea how to handle that. Or your mother calls you and tells you that she has contracted cancer. Or one of the young women that you have responsibility for in your ward announces that she's transgender. Or your bishop has an affair with another member of your ward. Perhaps the IRS starts garnishing your paycheck. Or you're a single parent burning the candle at both ends and you're just exhausted. Or you're constantly fighting with your family about politics. Oh, no, no, that never never, happens. Never happens in my family. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Maybe you hate your job or your boss or, or you're single and you're alone and you don't know when you're ever going to get married. In these situations, this reality of life that we live in, can we still feel joy? What does Heavenly Father expect of us in these moments? And is it really real to feel joy no matter what is happening around you? We can testify that that is real. It is tangible and real to feel joy. Lehi taught us this when he was talking to his son Jacob, that man is to have joy in 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 25. It's quoted all the time. And President Nelson, he echoed this sentiment in his talk, Joy and Spiritual Survival, when he said this. 
Saints can be happy under every circumstance. We can feel joy even while having a bad day, a bad week, or even a bad year. My dear brothers and sisters, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. Then President Nelson reminded us later in that same talk that Jesus Christ is joy and that that joy from Jesus, that is what is imperative for our spiritual survival. So why did Heavenly Father drop us into the middle of this battle? Obviously, we know we had to come here to get a body and to see if we could qualify for exaltation. But aren't we also here to enjoy the journey that we're on, even during those adversities that we just talked about? Right. All of those things that come up that we never expect or just the daily triggers that get you. We are to have joy and, and seek for the to qualify for the blessings of exaltation. Obviously, If you're listening to this, we assume (laughs) that you have also already participated in one of the necessary ordinances by being baptized by proper authority, receiving the Holy Ghost. And that got you onto the covenant path that the brethren are always talking about. But then after entering into that path is all done. If we listen to Nephi, he answers that for us in 2 Nephi chapter 31 verse 20 when he says this. Quote, Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Just getting into the path after baptism is not sufficient. We must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ and a perfect brightness of hope. And the great thing is, you guys, is that it isn't hard when we do it the Lord's way. The Lord's way is always the easy way. It is always the easy way. He reiterates that for us over and over again. To help us look at the Lord's way, let's look at the three worlds that we get to participate in every single day of our lives. You get to make the choice about which of these worlds you spend the majority of your mental energy in. Yes. These three worlds. I remember when I really grasped these concepts and was introduced to the three worlds. And it it can be a life changer for you. So first, the first world, we refer to it as the temporal world. You know, it's not that complicated. <laughs> it's not hard to spend time in this world because it's everywhere all around us in the in this celestial state that we're in. The temporal world is where we pay our bills and do our dishes and our child gets a bee sting and comes running and screaming about it. It's where we go to work and it, it's not hard to focus temporally. This is where all of our problems come from. Every time you wake up in the morning, especially on the days when you miss your alarm clock and and you trip on that Lego that, oh, it hurts so bad, like that puts you in a temporal focus for the rest of the day. And it, to be temporally focused, we can categorically say that this is not why we are here on the earth. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I've ever been in L, at LDS home and seen a big sign by the front door that says, remember to focus temporally today. Right. <laughs> So the next world we'll look at is what we call the spiritual world. This is where all of your best friends are, your heavenly father, heavenly mother, the savior, all the angels who have been given charge over you, the Holy Ghost. The spiritual dimension is where you develop high feelings of self-worth. It's where the power of the priesthood is. This is where the power of forgiveness comes from. This is the dimension where when you pray, the Lord gives you personal revelation And all the solutions come from the spiritual world. Now, some of you might hear this and think that to spend our time in the spiritual world means that we're going to have to be in the temple all day or kneeling in prayer constantly and that we'll never take care of the kids or feed the dog or go to work. And this is absolutely not true. All we have to do is simply change our paradigm so that we are doing all of our temporal world responsibilities and everyday assignments for the Lord. That's right. And and it takes us and transcends us into a spiritual focus. 
we'll we'll get much more into that in thought habit number one and thought habit number two. Okay, before we go into the third world, I want to paint a picture for those of you who may not be watching the video at this point. If you can imagine with me a piece of paper, the temporal world is in a circle on the bottom of the paper. Then the spiritual world is on the top of the paper. Then we have the third world, which is our inner world. That is a circle that is between the spiritual and the temporal world themselves. The scriptures refer to this as our inner man. We also have reference in the scriptures to us being a temple of God. The inner world is where we are temple presidents over what happens to us. We have two faculties in our temple. That is our mind and our heart. And if you take control over what you think and what you feel, that is the magic sauce to becoming spiritually centered together with Jesus Christ. Our thoughts and our emotions can become spiritually centered when we exercise our agency to focus spiritually. So you have the power to move your inner world up into the spiritual dimension or down into the temporal dimension. So when you choose to do an anger or do a frustration or an overwhelm or you choose to do a myopic, like President Nelson referred to it as, your inner world goes down into the temporal focus. In moments like this, the temporal world is in opposition to the spiritual world. We're going into darkness. Our or our inner world can go up into the spiritual world. When you do the prayer program or the praise program, when you look to God and doubt not, fear not, then you start to receive inspiration and answers to all your problems. When you're spiritually focused, the temporal world is actually not in opposition to the spiritual world. Can you remember a time in your life when you were able to, in the middle of a trial, look at everything from that 10,000-foot view? All of a sudden, right in the midst of that crazy challenge, were you able to say inside yourself, I can actually see how this is going to be beneficial for my growth? That's what it feels like to be spiritually focused. It gives you that 10,000-foot view, and you are able to use everything everything in this temporal world for your spiritual growth. Now that we've introduced you to the three worlds that we get to participate in every day, we want to talk about what it actually means in our daily experiences to be temporally focused or or spiritually focused. We're going to start looking at how to live in a temporal focus first, just in case you want to work on that. If you haven't had enough practice already... <laughs> This is what it's like to be temporally focused. You only enjoy the weekend. You get irritated when kids ask you simple questions. Never have enough time, ever. You're constantly a taxi. You're triggered by the everyday tasks of doing the laundry and the dishes and going to work. You feel pressure and anxiety most of the day. You're constantly turning to some type of addiction with food, phone, games, social media, and it can go on and on as far as addictions are concerned. And perhaps you're feeling overwhelmed and you're tired all the time. You're not sure if the Holy Ghost is with you, and you're not sure if you're on track for the celestial kingdom. Now let's look in contrast of what it looks like to focus spiritually. Instead of only enjoying the weekend, you're actually enjoying every single day. And as a parent, you're patient with your kids most of the time. Right. It's the 80 20 rule. I'm, I'm, that's I'm what I always most of the time. <laughs> that's what I always tell myself when I have a temporally focused moment. <laughs> well, and, and instead of that, that overwhelming feeling of not having enough time, you feel less stress. You're able to get most things or everything done. You're happy to do those everyday tasks for the Lord. Your feeling of self worth increases. You recognize the triggers that usually would cause you to reach for your addiction, and you're able to withstand them. You feel closer to Heavenly Father and to your Savior, Jesus Christ. You know with a surety that you're on track for exaltation, and you recognize that revelation comes to you throughout your day. Yeah, yeah, and and it's the feeling of 
that your eye is single to the glory of God. Okay, let's go to the scriptures. We, we got to get into the scripture meat of all of this and use a story in order to find an example of what we just went over with the three worlds. So how did Nephi solve his problem? That is the story. First Nephi chapter 18. This is a story that anyone who has ever started the Book of Mormon over and over again has read many times. There's a reason this is at the beginning of the That's Book of Mormon. That's exactly right. This is when Nephi is on the ship with his brothers, and they start partying and having a good time. And Nephi can feel that the spirit is leaving the ship, and so he stands up to them. And they did not like that. They wanted to keep going with their own curriculum of the day of partying instead of repenting and turning back to a spiritual focus and using God's curriculum. So they bound Nephi's ankles and wrists, tied him to the mast, and for four days he was in that situation. The thing that is amazing to me about Nephi in this particular moment is that he had no idea how long he was going to be tied to that mast. For all he knew, he was going to die there. During those days, everything around him was very temporally focused. The kids were crying. His parents were dying. The waves were bashing the ship back and forth. His wife, I'm sure, tried to help him several times. And he saw the pain on her face and the panic. And everyone was throwing up and seasick. And if there's anything that's a temporal world experience, that would be it. So just picture this for a moment. And then take some time to think about your own life. Why did the Lord leave this example in here that we would read over and over again when we started the Book of Mormon over and over? It is because we can identify with it. I don't know about you, but there's plenty of times when I feel like I am tied to that mast and my life is being bashed by the waves back and forth. I mean, don't you feel that way? The emotions in those difficult times, they're so potent and they're so real. We have this example as a guide to us when our homes are being tossed to and fro. So then we've got to ask ourselves, what did Nephi do in his inner world during this extremely temporal world experience? Let's look at the scripture. What did Nephi do? In chapter 18, verse 16, we read what he was doing during those four days. He tells us, Nevertheless, I did look to my God and I did praise him all day long. Wow. So, so which dimension did he stay focused in? The spiritual world. What did he do to stay spiritually focused during his adversity? He praised God all day long and didn't murmur because of his adversities. He could have focused on his inner world of being seasick and his wrists and ankles hurting and on people starving to death and getting lost in the middle of the ocean. This doesn't mean that he wasn't feeling those emotions. Right. He, that he, he wasn't some kind of spiritual robot. Exactly. He, he was a real person. And I think we tend to look at, at these these men and women, these heroes of ours from the scriptures, and just assume that they were a cut above. They were right. better than me. Because that they had something that we don't. They had to be some able kind of power of, yeah. of spirituality that I don't have, but they don't. What they do have is an understanding of this principle of praise that Nephi used. And he was very aware of what was going on around him. But he would not allow the faculties of his mind and heart to become temporally focused. He knew a power principle, and that is any time an adversity comes upon us, the power of Christ is manifested in that adversity. If you are spiritually focused during an adversity, you release the power of Christ and miracles will occur. Those miracles are they're either they're going to happen in your external environment or within you personally. That's right. I experienced this very personally during those months of watching my loved ones dying. Every day I worked to stay spiritually focused and steadfast in Jesus Christ. 
like Nephi, I was I just did my best to praise the Lord while my ship was getting bashed by the storm around me and I was tied to this mast. And the time came that the power of the atonement it was released on my behalf and miracles occurred. Really actually too many to recount, but I will share a couple. First of all, it was a miracle that all of our family was able to be together from great distances to be with my mother before she passed for her last perfect day on earth. Her last day was just, the details would take too much time to describe, but we had miracles occur on our behalf so everyone could see her, be with her, and say goodbye. One of the miracles that occurred for me personally that changed my inner world happened while my brother had the very sacred task of pronouncing a priesthood blessing of a release for my mom. And in that moment, I was allowed to see beyond the veil and witness breathtakingly sacred things. It was just this gift. And the Spirit whispered to me, the reality of the covenants that we have made in the temple as a family and that my family relationships that I have, that they are indeed eternal and binding and lasting and beautiful. Miracles can and will occur in our lives when we practice this principle of praise. In Nephi's experience, he stayed steadfast. And look at the miracles that occurred. In verse 21, it says he prayed and the winds did cease, the storm did cease, and there was great calm. And he was able to take the liahona and it immediately worked. If he had been temporally focused through that experience, would there have been any way that he would have seen these same results? Would the compass have worked? No, no, of course not. No. Yeah. You, you and I have tried this yes. before, haven't we? We have. Haven't we been in a situation where we've been complaining and arguing and fighting and and the work's so hard and why right. me? And, and how terrible our current situation is. And... Exactly. Just in that darkness of the temporal focus. And then our wife or our child comes to us and says, will you give me a blessing or will you pray with me? Do we feel in that moment like calling down the powers of heaven for that person? No, of course not. There are others, other examples of this in the scriptures. We are going to talk about two more briefly, Abinadi and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like Nephi, none of them knew what the outcome of their situation would be, but they both chose to praise God anyway. Both were accused before the state. Both stood trial, so to speak, and both were contempt, condemned to death. They also both stayed true to their testimony of Christ and refused to concede in the face of that death sentence that was promised by the state. Obviously, we know the miracle that occurred for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were miraculously saved within the fire. But what about Abinadi? Where was his miracle for staying steadfast in Christ? The miracle that happened for Abinadi was Alma. Alma, his heart, Alma's heart. The testimony that Alma received that day turned the course of the Nephites forever. And we see his influence throughout the remainder of the Book of Mormon. Right. And I, I firmly believe that Abinadi would go through that over and over again for that specific miracle to have occurred. Absolutely. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's my favorite favorite story, but it's not necessarily because they were saved from the fire. It's because of what they said before. They were, they told King Nebuchadnezzar that they knew that they could be saved, but then they said these words, but if not. I, I, this is a principle. I we, say, we call, we call this the but if not principle that, at our house. Yes, that's exactly right. They were willing to go through whatever was going to show up, whatever the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon them. Yes, exactly. The but if not principle is this Father, I praise you, and I know that you have the power to deliver me, or my mom, or my sister, or whoever it might be, 
But if not, I will never cease to praise thee, and I know I am protected in the hollow of thy hand forever. Okay, so let's go back and look at Nephi with his amazing power of staying spiritually focused in the midst of his adversity. If we were to use our inner world, our mind and our heart, to praise God all day long, how differently would you react to some of the scenarios that we mentioned earlier? Some of those really steep adversities. In praise and in that just praising God all day long, How would that change your reaction when your husband tells you he has lost his job or when your daughter tells you that she's decided to be bisexual or when you find out that the IRS is garnishing your paycheck? How do those adversities possibly change because of you choosing to spiritually focus through praising God? Just get curious about that. That's right. We just invite you at this point to get curious about what the power of praise is can do for you in your life during these very reality, the the realities of life, the situations that are tied to that mass in our everyday lives. Exactly. All right. After going through the Nephi story, hopefully you have a better idea of the three worlds and their roles, the temporal world, the spiritual world and our inner world. We will encourage you to do a lot of self-counseling through these lessons. And that self con- that self counseling in that you want to be honest with yourself about where you are centered. Whether you, lo- you live in a temporal focus the majority of the time or a spiritual focus. And by the way, this is to clarify, being honest with yourself it does not give you permission to do an overwhelm, but it does give you permission to do a repent. Remember, we focus on progression here. We do not focus on perfection. (laughs) Understanding where you are focused is the first step to becoming spiritually focused itself and turning to God. You can say things like, like this is a prayer I'll say in my mind, Lord, I know I'm not spiritually focused right now. (laughs) I'm super irritated with my kids. Help me to repent and turn to thee. Please forgive me and lift me higher through the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. I praise you, Father, for giving me this moment to remember that I am temporally focused and I can't do it without you or my Savior. But I can turn to thee for help and together we can solve this. And I praise you, Father. I praise you for thy Son, Even when I'm temporally focused, I can turn to thee and bring light to my mind and heart by praising thee. Just saying a simple prayer like this, it shifts that mind furniture around that we talked about a ton, and it lifts you to a higher spiritual dimension. Well, it also offers what what Tony Robbins calls a pattern interrupt. That's right. Exactly. And that's how that's what you have to do with your first step to resetting a pattern is interrupt that pattern. Yes. And President Nelson, he told us about how rigorous it is. He said this. It is mentally rigorous to strive to look unto him in every thought. But when we do, our doubts and fears flee. Like President Nelson said, it is real to have no doubt and no fear. Andrea brought up a huge how with being able to focus spiritually. That is prayer. How do we feel and think as Christ? We pray always. Think about that. The scriptures ask us over and over and over again to pray always and not faint. It's because prayer is the key skill for becoming spiritually focused. Alma 37, we read this. Yea, cry unto the Lord for all thy support. Yea, let all thy doings be unto the Lord. And whithersoever thou goest, let it be unto the Lord. Yea, let all thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Yea, let the affections of thy heart be placed on the Lord forever. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. Yea, when thou liest down at night, lie unto the Lord, that he may watch over you in your sleep. And when thou risest in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. And if ye do these things, ye shall be lifted up in the last day. Do all these things for the Lord. What does that mean? 
that when we wash the sheets from our for the third time this week yeah. from our from our child having an accident, we do it for the Lord. When our car breaks down and we have to push it to the side of the side of the road, we do that for the Lord. When we have to weed the garden, we do it for the Lord. That's what that means. Can you do the dishes and make it a spiritual growth experience? Yes, you can. <laughs> Brent's tried it. I've done this. <laughs> Whenever he's washing dishes, I know he's trying to focus spiritually. <laughs> That's the only reason I like to wash the dishes. <laughs> when you do any activity in this temporal world with a spiritual focus, that's what these activities in the temporal world are for. They are, op- they are our opportunity to practice to focus spiritually. And if we praise God and pray all day long within them, then our growth to becoming like Jesus Christ happens. Everything you do in life is important for your spiritual growth. You can do all those normal everyday activities just because they need to be done. Right. Because, you know, that's what you do. But why not do them for the Lord so that he can increase everything and consecrate it for the welfare of your soul? And why do we pray always? It's because that is how we focus the two faculties in our inner world, our mind and heart. And it's how we access the powers of heaven. It's how we develop godly attributes, and it's how we exercise faith in Jesus Christ. It's how we change our thought habits to match the Savior's habits, and it's how we come to feel as Christ feels. We know we've given you a lot to chew on in this lesson. Praising God and praying always are the foundation. For, they are foundational. They are for every single lesson that will that will follow. That's right. And even if you feel like you're praising and praying a lot already, most of us don't do it 24 hours a day. There's always improvement to be made. Well, and if you feel like you're never praising or you're a long way off from praying always, that's okay. We're here to guide you through building those spiritual muscles to become spiritually focused. Our first challenge for you is to take a few days before you listen to the next lesson to practice praising God in all things, like we read in Alma. Work on identifying where you feel like you are focused throughout your day. Are you spiritually focused or temporally focused more throughout your day? And be honest with yourself because it will be much easier to see your progress as you start to change that focus. Because you're going to take a couple of days to apply what you've learned in this lesson, we encourage you to make an appointment with yourself for when you're going to listen to lesson two. Set some kind of reminder in your phone or a planner or whatever you use so that you remember to move on to lesson two and continue on this process of learning. Yeah, that's exactly it. The second challenge that we invite you to is listen to the guided meditation that we have provided It's a companion to this lesson, and it's called The Three Worlds. It is linked to the podcast, and you can also find it on our website, worthofsoulspodcast.com. We've also provided a sample prayer, and we don't necessarily want to give you a rote prayer, but we wanted to give some examples of prayer and praise phrases that you can use throughout your day and tweak it, make it personal with whatever you need to do so it becomes yours. Absolutely. Make it your own. Living a life of, of, of a spiritual focus paradigm, praising God in all things and praying always, is the first step to becoming a Zion-like person. I don't know if you have struggled with this as I have, but for a long time, I couldn't see how this people, the Latter-day Saints, could ever be sufficiently prepared to walk into the city Zion and be the people ready to receive the Lord for his millennial reign. I have read about the people of the city of Enoch and the Nephites that met the Savior in the New World and the Zion societies they created, and all I could see was this great chasm between where we are as a people now and where those people were, walking daily with the Lord. So how can we become a Zion Zion society in the midst of this wicked world? Right, in the middle of this war. Well, that's what the lessons are about. (laughs) The answer really, truly lies in these 14 lessons. And like we said, it's not anything that Brent and Andrea Palmer made up. They are timeless principles from the Lord. 
your feelings and actions and thoughts, they're going to become closer to matching the Savior's. Your fulfillment and the excitement for each day is going to increase as you apply what you're going to be learning. Your self-worth will expand dramatically, and your relationship with your heavenly parents and the Savior will just grow exponentially. Living the gospel is a joy. It is such a joy. And if you have wondered how to get yourself and your family ready for that glorious day when the Savior returns— then please don't stop listening. Continue. If you go back and read President Nelson's talk since he became the prophet, his number one priority has been to help us become a Zion-like people. And we testify that our Lord and Savior is indeed coming back. Oh, I just, I get chills when I say it. (laughs) Let's make sure that we're ready to meet him together. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of your life today. We're so glad and we're honored that you're you're with us on this journey and that you're exercising these spiritual muscles. Give yourself the gift of applying what you have learned. And until we talk again, remember that the worth of your soul is great in the sight of God. The Worth of Souls podcast is not an official publication of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you have any questions about the doctrines discussed here, please visit the church's official website for clarification.